an error. Life adapts, competes and evolves into fascinating and complex forms. It's just over a week later, on May 10th, that the first dinosaurs evolved during the Triassic period. Watching these giants wander the earth is a childhood fantasy. Creatures like the Allosaurus, the Stegosaurus, the Triceratops, and of course, the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Each one simultaneously terrifying and captivating. We relish studying these giants, but just five days later, an enormous meteorite more than 10 miles across enters the atmosphere. The impact is truly decimating, raising a cloud of dust into the atmosphere that blots out the sun, darkening the skies and cooling the world. You mournfully watch as the era of the dinosaurs abruptly ends, marking the transition between the Cretaceous and Paleogene periods. It is now on May 15th that small mammals start to fill the ecological niche left open. Your direct ancestors. You check your watch as history fulfills itself. In two days on May 17th, you'll pass the date that you left the earth. Thus far, you've witnessed the past play out. Broadly familiar events inferred from the geological okay, record. So I'm playing in the same but now, I now you're about to over. move into the future. You watch as the mountains the advance over the earth, growing in the size and, and complexity. In the sink, so. Graves, hominids, homo sapiens. This is it. You're about to see our own fate, the future of the human race. At 3.48 p.m., modern humans emerge. Just 13 minutes later, they begin farming and erecting buildings as you pass the Neolithic Revolution. Less than one minute after that point, 20,000 years by local time, it's over. Humanity is gone. The tape played so fast you couldn't see what happened to us. Did we move to another planet? Did we switch to artificial intelligence? Did we simply extinguish ourselves? In a flash, our cities and monuments crumble, decay, and disintegrate into dust, blowing off into the wind. Civilization doesn't rise again, for us or for any other species. For the Earth will not sustain these ideal conditions which we enjoy during a brief episode of thought, self-awareness, and reflection. The Earth's biosphere will only diminish from this point on. May 20th. It's been three days since humanity disappeared. For the umpteenth time, the continents have converged into a giant supercontinent. You sit there, depressed, watching the eons flick by, the future unfold. The world is changing. When you first arrived, the Earth's atmosphere was rich in carbon dioxide, keeping the planet warm despite the sun's faint output. But over the past four and a half billion years, the sun has grown more luminous as its core gradually contracts. It's now 30% more luminous, bathing the earth in ever greater heat. As the insulation upon the earth rises, evaporation cycles speed up, precipitation increases. As these rains fall through the atmosphere, the droplets soak up molecules of carbon dioxide, forming a weak carbonic acid. In human lifetimes, you'd never noticed this, but now you see it. The rain dissolving away the rocks through weathering. The carbonic acid reacts with the silicon materials in the rock, forming carbonates that wash down to the ocean beds. The warmer the sun becomes, the faster this weathering occurs pulling out ever greater amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, faster than volcanism or life's respiration can replenish it. The Earth is becoming starved 
of carbon dioxide. This is the way it's always been. Carbon dioxide and temperature in a constant back and forth, keeping the atmosphere more or less the same temperature throughout the ages. A global thermostat operating on a time scale of hundreds of thousands of years. Because CO2 is a heat trapping gas, its decreasing levels help keep the planet cool in the face of a warming sun. But carbon dioxide can only go so low. By May 27, carbon dioxide levels have decreased so much that the bioproductivity of the planet is one half of that of the era that you came from. Carbon dioxide is the fuel of photosynthesis, and without it, the food chain dwindles. It's ironic. The very chemical that humanity fought so hard to remove from the Earth's atmosphere is now the very chemical that the biosphere so desperately lacks. Over the next couple of days, you watch the spread of Earth rapidly change. Forests become less common. Animals fewer in number, and the planet becomes less green with each passing hour. Remember it's on June 1st, what he's talking CO2 about is all theories because a lot of this stuff has not been proven. Below 150 it's just a theory. Parts per million, leading to the mass extinction of all organisms that rely on the C3 photosynthesis reaction. But long ago, life evolved a more sophisticated alternative called C4 that can cope with CO2 levels as low as 10 parts per million. In the blink of an eye, these C4 plants and microbes fill the ecological hole opened by their demised cousins. But ultimately, this just delays the inevitable, as the sun just keeps warming. And so the CO2 just keeps tumbling. How long can this go on for? It's on June 13th that you get your answer. Your right hand watch tells you the year is 900 million AD. It's now. The CO2 levels finally fall below 10 ppm. A critical value and the point where photosynthesis fails. Life cannot adapt. C4 plants like millet, maize, and sugarcane are the first to die, followed by photosynthetic microbes. The surface what? turns gray and brown. Within the space of three million years, or just over two hours by your watch, you are now forced to bear witness to the most heartbreaking spectacle. Without photosynthesis, Oxygen levels rapidly decline across the world. Large herbivores are the first to perish, their food supply gone. Large placental mammals go next with their relatively high oxygen requirements. Next, you watch as small mammals die in their burrows. Birds fall to the ground. Dead fish fill the oceans. By the end of this terrible two hours, even invertebrates, like the insects, are gone. The Earth's oxygen has been depleted. The reign of multicellular life is over. You reflect back then. It was a good run. For two and a half billion years, they roamed the Earth, about 20% of the planet's lifetime. But now you look out at an Earth that has gone into shock, returning to its earlier microbial era. It's still a living world, but one very different from the one that you once knew. With the carbon dioxide depleted, there's no buffering left for the Earth's temperature. The planet begins to rapidly warm. Not only does the temperature rise, but the surface water becomes more saline, salty, as water evaporates away. The remaining life departs the equatorial zones and finds some solace in the polar regions and 
high altitude lakes where the temperatures remain cool. Life might be restricted to microbial forms as it was in the earliest days on Earth, but this life is far more sophisticated. Hey. But unlike those primitive, simple life forms, the microbes living now are the product of five billion years of evolution. Highly competitive Darwinian natural selection honing their genomes. In particular, okay, extremophiles so adapted for high temperature and saline Darwin environments world. resist that's extinction just, and persist as the Earth warms. Watching this play out gives you some comfort to see these advanced cells stare down the Earth's warming climate. At least they still hold the torch of life going. Towards the end of June, over a billion years into our future, the Earth's daughter, the Moon, has gradually receded okay, away so far that its lives. gravitation no longer acts to stabilize the Earth's obliquity. This causes the planet to axially process, leading to much greater seasonal one. variations. So I can hang it on my wall. My much of the Earth becomes uninhabitable, even to extremes.